guys. Well, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I see some familiar faces here today. Welcome. I'm Emily Russell, and I have the honor of working as the Marketing and Business Development Director here at Clearview. Um, and we host a monthly lunch and learn for you to come and learn about various and assorted health topics to help improve your quality of life and that of your family as well. Um, so today we have a special guest with us again. If you were here last month, he looks familiar to you. But Dr. Joel Garrison is our new family practice doctor here in town. And he's getting his practice up and rolling. His practice is actually located over on Breedlove Drive, just across the street from the old hospital. It's 704 Breedlove Drive. So if you're interested and you need a new primary care physician, he is accepting new patients. And he is a phenomenal physician and would love to have any of you guys on board with him. Um, so today's topic is kind of interesting. I'm going to let him get into it. I apologize we don't have the overhead today, um, but we do have handouts printed for you to be able to see a little bit better. Sometimes the devil lives in technology, and apparently that's what has happened. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Garrison. Go for it. So um, instead of doing the, the slides on the TV, we'll just kind of go um, on the paper. We can go one by one. Um, today's topic is pain in older adults, and the main focus of it is going to be uh, away from medications, so non-pharmacologic therapies, things you can do to help with pain. So, quick outline. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences between acute and persistent pain, um, and those will come into play when we talk about different strategies that might work or be helpful also talk about the goal and strategy of pain management for older adults and how that differs um, and what sort of things we look for and then we'll go into the different therapies and finally we'll end with a few of the common medications um, things you know over the counter as well as some prescriptions all right so getting started um, kind of wanted to go over the difference in uh, the definition of persistent pain um, so that's pain that continues beyond the extent of time of healing or for at least three to six months. Um, and that comes into play when we talk about different treatment modalities, um, things that might work. So continuing on with persistent pain, something that lasts more than three or six months, the, uh, there's three general expectations for managing persistent pain. Um, the first one is understanding that it's multifactorial. So there's going to be uh, different approaches that work together to help with the pain. Um, another big expectation is that it's not always curable, but improvement is anticipated and it is treatable. And finally, although the pain may not be totally eliminated, substantial improvement in function is realistic. And when you're talking about something like persistent pain or persistent problems, the main goal there is um, improvement in function and prevention of disability. So kind of extrapolating from that, the goal then of pain management, specifically in older adults, is prioritizing improving the function over reducing pain. And that's sort of because, um, you know, with a lot of medications out there, modalities, you can completely get rid of someone's pain, but if that makes them limit their mobility, or if that makes them too drowsy, or if um, they're unable to use a body part because the pain's gone, then you're limiting function and causing disability, and that's kind of uh, going against the goal of pain management. So, um, moving on, I get this question a lot, should I have an x-ray? Do we need to look at this uh, with an imaging study? Um, and in a lot of cases, the answer to that is no. And that's because even if the x-ray shows that there might be some degeneration, um, some arthritis, that doesn't correlate to pain. So you could have someone with um, complete loss of cartilage in their knee, what you call bone on bone, and have zero pain. And you could have another patient with a completely normal x-ray of their knee with healthy cartilage and still have pain. So the imaging results do not always correlate, in a, especially not with pain, in pain levels. So going into um, the strategy of pain management in older adults, um, 
So the best strategy is always to use the least potentially toxic interventions, followed um, by those more toxic or having greater risks. So it's always worth trying something with very low risk, non-toxic, before starting something that um, could have a higher risk to it, such as medications. And on that same note, systemic medications are then introduced later step in older adults due to the increased potential for side effects. And the big one is interactions with medications that are used to treat chronic illnesses, um, such as high blood pressure or diabetes, high cholesterol. A lot of these systemic medications for pain management can interact. So uh, it's, you have to be very careful and um, you don't always jump to medications as the first, first line of management. Kind of going on from that, so the preferred initial therapy is non-pharmacological treatments or localized medications, which might be um, topical medications or injections, and we'll go into those as well. And then lastly, when, the, uh, when those strategies are ineffective, we can start adding in medications uh, based off of the patient's other health history and other comorbidities. All right, so now going into the meat and potatoes of this talk, let's talk about what options are available, specifically what options other than medications are available to treat pain. Um, and I broke this down into two generalized categories. First, we'll talk about acute pain and um, what's commonly known as arthritis, which is age-related arthritis or osteoarthritis, which is age-related um, degeneration or breakdown of cartilage, things like that. And then um, we'll go into um, non-medicine non options for chronic pain as well. So a brief overview of the, the things we'll discuss with acute and or osteoarthritic pain. Um, strategies include weight loss, rest, exercise, manipulative therapies, um, orthotics, thermal therapies, and then a few others. We'll touch on each of those now. So the big one off the bat is for acute pain or arthritic, arthritic pain, uh, weight loss is an excellent um, way to prevent that and to deal with it going forward. So we have studies that show that a 10 pound weight loss over 10 years decreased the probability of developing knee arthritis by 50%. And so it, um, just a little bit of weight loss can prevent half of people from developing knee arthritis. And the good news there is the relationship between the weight loss and the incidence of arthritis was linear, so even one pound of weight loss helps immensely with preventing further damage to things like your knees or your hips. Uh, studies also show that one pound of weight loss above the waist decreases uh, four pounds on the knees and other load-bearing joints. So you can see how that could add up immensely. Next, with acute pain, um, one of the big things that we all know is um, if you acutely injure something, you probably want to rest it for a little bit. Um, the caveat here is rest is only recommended for short periods of time, so 12 to 24 hours afterwards, after which um, you want to resume active range of motion of the joint in exercises. This is especially true for shoulder injuries. Um, and you may have heard of the term frozen shoulder. Um, that's due to um, someone may have injured their shoulder and due to pain um, stopped using the shoulder with a full range of motion and over time um, the shoulder will freeze up and then you won't have use of it at all. So that's, um, that's one of the best examples of over resting an illness. Next for kind of acute pain, exercise and physical therapy. So we know from a lot of studies that people who exercise regularly are healthier and live longer than people who don't. But the best part about that is exercise does not need to be intense in order to improve health and avoid disability. Uh, we talked last month about what exercise is, um, is important and what's needed and uh, kind of the, the rundown on that is even walking three to five times a week for 30 minutes 
is adequate exercise to stay healthy. So goals of exercise programs for dealing with um, acute pain and dealing with arthritic pain. Um, so the goal of exercise programs, reduce pain and reduce functional impairment, protect the involved site of pain and at-risk joints. So if someone has pain in the right knee, uh, want to make sure that exercise is tailored to prevent that same pain from affecting the left knee. So doing an exercise regimen that works on both joints. <coughs> and then of course with exercise, we want to prevent uh, the prevention of disability related to inactivity. And it's kind of going back to the frozen shoulder example. Um, inactivity <coughs> could lead to worsening of an acute injury. Also, so we know from studies that land-based therapeutic exercises uh, provide short-term pain relief that could be sustained for two to six months after cessation of formal treatment. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. If you have an injury and you do um, some focused physical therapy or focused exercises for a short period of time, that relief can last two to six months afterwards, even if you stop exercising. So it just kind of shows how important exercise and maintaining mobility is. So what type of exercises are good? Um, the ones that are low, low efforts, such as swimming, bicycling, walking, or Tai Chi. And those are helpful in developing muscular strength while protecting joints. And what's recommended for exercise therapy is a cardiovascular warm up. So doing a little bit of walking, followed by stretching, then going into the exercise therapy. And that's something I think we all know to begin with. You don't want to just uh, jump into a, a rigorous exercise without doing a little bit of warm up and a little bit of stretching, um, especially when you're dealing with joint pain, such as knee pain or hip pain or back pain. And then one of the uh, hardest parts about exercise for everyone is compliance, so staying on the exercise regimen, uh, making sure week in and week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, you're continuing to do that exercise. So the compliance can be maximized uh, through several different techniques, um, including simplifying the regimen, setting attainable goals, having an open discussion about the importance and the benefits of exercise, which we're doing today, uh, providing social interaction with exercise, so that's exercise groups, meeting with personal trainers or physical therapists, maybe once a week or once a month, um, and part of that is providing regular follow-up and adjusting the exercise regimen accordingly. So either meeting with your doctor or meeting with your exercise therapist, your physical therapist, or maybe even a trainer at the gym who you can meet with once a month um, and set goals and see how you're progressing. And then one more caveat on exercise. Um, so the studies show that whether you're doing aerobic training or resistance training, <coughs> you get equal benefit in arthritis-related symptoms and disability. So uh, whether you like to, to bicycle or uh, walk on the treadmill or you like to do um, uh, lifting weights, things like that, um, no matter what type of the exercise it is, there's equal benefits for arthritis-related pain and prevention of disability, which is the ultimate goal. All right, I feel like I'm moving a little fast. Any questions? Okay, we'll keep moving. So the next, um, next area we'll talk about for acute and arthritis pain is manipulative therapy. Uh, and I'm an osteopathic physician, so I do hands-on manipulative therapy as well, uh, but it's just not uh, my field. It's also seen uh, chiropractors do manipulative therapy, physical therapists do hands-on manipulative therapy. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of ways to, to get manipulative therapy. Uh, but there are differences, and so there's different types of manipulative therapy, and it can range from spinal and joint manipulation to muscle and soft tissue directed manipulation. Um, the important thing there is uh, to have a, a thorough history and accurate diagnosis so the clinician knows what they're treating. Um, for instance, um, sciatica, a common condition, um, could range from uh, a spinal issue where you might need spinal manipulation, but it could also be a muscular issue um, in the, the gluteal muscles 
or there's a, a muscle there called the piriformis as well that's notorious for causing um, sciatica-like pains. Um, so being able to, to diagnose and figure out what needs to be treated, uh, manipulative therapy um, could be extremely effective for acute pain. And sort of a, uh, what manipulative therapy looks like uh, can be anything from joints cracking and popping to uh, stretching muscles to massage therapy as well and relaxing the, uh, the soft tissues of the body. All right, so moving on, the next um, non-medicine um, approach to acute pain so um, orthoses or uh, orthotics. There's mixed, uh, mixed data out on what's effective for folks. Um, there's not a lot of studies, but one thing we can all agree on in the medical field is always wear appropriate footwear when doing activities. So if you have uh, low back pain or you have hip or knee pain and you're doing a certain activity, you're doing yard work, um, maybe uh, working in the garage, you want to make sure you have appropriate footwear. Um, that doesn't put you in a vulnerable situation. Yes, sir. What is the recommended best way to deal with like bursitis and tendonitis? Bursitis. The bursitis and tendonitis um, of uh, large joints, or well, it's in, for, for my problem is in the, in the, in the, in the hip. In the hip. So I've had a cortisone shot that worked, but mm -hmm. it just didn't last for a couple months. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So the, uh, again, that's where the multifactorial approach using a lot of the non-medicine uh, approaches would be helpful. So a uh, um, directed exercise regimen to strengthen the muscles around the hip um, to prevent the bursitis from flaring up. Um, also some hands-on manipulative therapy, whether that's uh, massage therapy or, um, or stretching the leg muscles, things like that. Um, and then sticking with the kind of the orthoses, uh, making sure you're wearing um, balanced shoes and that there's not a leg length discrepancy. Because a lot of hip issues come from um, one leg being maybe a centimeter longer than the other, um, in which patients need a uh, kind of a shoe insert to balance that out and make sure they're not leaning one way or the other and irritating that. My local family doctor there, he said they walk across the floor. I could not walk from Thank here you. to there. Without leaving. Mm -hmm. And so he says basically you have bruise you have a deep bruise and had I had right on that hip joint there. <coughs> it's amazing. He sent me to Dreyer here, and I'm sure there's other places too in Monroe um, around. Mm -hmm. And they told me the same thing. They said walk out across there. And when I got through with their like six weeks of exercise, everything went away, back to normal. Mm -hmm. And what what they told me was, if you have pain, like what he's talking about, you subconsciously start adjusting other parts of your body Absolutely. and other joint to try to get rid of the pain. Compensating for which it. Which is what I was doing, and it was turning into a limp. I could not, to, to not have that pain, I walked with a limp. Mm -hmm. And for so, sure. um, and, and you know, I'd take a... Uh, a light pain pill here and there, but the doctor said that's not the, that's not going to get you where you want to be. Right. So the exercise and the therapy, and I'm, I mean, they had things I had to balance on, and, and mm -hmm. things that were soft on one side and hard on the other side that you walked on, and <coughs> different elastic things on ankles and all, and no, it, the pain just worked itself out over mm -hmm. a period of time. Plus, I guess that's what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Like that. And uh, especially, uh, it does work. I appreciate you bringing up the point where the, they were doing exercises with you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of it. And with acute pain, you want to continue to exercise, even if you're continuing to have a little bit of pain, um, almost like you want to work through it. Yeah. Um, because the inactivity and the immobility um, leads to worsening of the pain and then disability down the road. The more you sit, the worse it gets. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still play basketball with my grandson, and sometimes I get up the next morning, and, boy, I'm sore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, upper upper body sore. 
and if you don't get out and start, if you don't keep playing basketball, it, it hurts worse. If you keep keep doing what you're doing, absolutely it works it out. And so rest, like we mentioned earlier, rest is okay for acute injuries for 12 to 24 hours, but any prolonged rest after that time is going to be detrimental. Um, so we talked about appropriate footwear. Um, now specifically about knees, um, there isn't great evidence to suggest that the big bulky knee braces are any better than the simple sleeves. So what I recommend for people is just to get the, um, the simple sleeve elastic knee brace if they're having knee issues. And then finally, there's, um, there's been some recent studies showing that different taping strategies for the knee are helpful. Uh, physical therapists and sports therapists do those taping. Um, you might see them on athletes on TV as well. Um, they use the tape kind of all over the body, but specifically the evidence shows it works really well on the knee for knee arthritis. Um, the next big group of things to try, and um, I'm sure a lot of you already do this, is the thermal therapies, so heating, packs, um, cold packs for acute injuries. Um, one thing I wanted to point out there is, uh, unfortunately, we do see quite a bit of uh, burns on folks for overusing a heating pad. Um, so the newer heating pads have self um, shut off timers, but some of the other ones can get hot and stay hot for a long time. And if you're uh, taking a nap on the couch and you put the heating pack on, you might, might wake up to a, a painful injury. Electric blankets are have that same <coughs> yep. problem. Yeah, especially <coughs> this time of year when you want to stay nice and cozy. Yep. Keep it on two or three. <laughs> yeah. um, so what the suggested approach is to alternate between um, 20 minutes of heating pad and then turn it off for 20 minutes. And then flip it back on if you feel like you need it. Um, so continuing on acute injuries, um, Another option is injections. Um, we talked about the uh, prednisone and steroid injection uh, for the hip. We'll get into those a little bit later in the talk as well, into more detail. Uh, but also Tai Chi, uh, a lot of data on that showing that it's helpful for acute injuries, um, staying active. So I put a, a picture in here of what kind of Tai Chi looks like. And it's um, mostly range of motion exercises um, directed by a, um, a leader of the group. And uh, it's similar to um, other group exercises like yoga um, that are just good for range of motion and stretching and staying active. All right, so moving into a um, different category now. So some uh, non-medicine therapies for, for chronic pain or non-arthritic pain. Uh, so a lot of these include the acute pain strategies that we talked about, like the exercise, physical therapy, um, especially with uh, chronic pains, you wanna stay as active as possible. Manipulative therapy is good as well. We, we covered that and then the thermal applications, heat and cold um, are good for uh, chronic pain as well, especially a low <coughs> back pain, um, a heating pack on the back. Uh, many people find that very effective. And a few other um, categories we'll go over next, the kind of behavioral medicine approaches, acupuncture, electronic neuromodulation, interventional approaches, and surgical approaches. We'll go over each of those in a little bit of detail. So for, again, we're talking about chronic pain, something lasting more than three to six months or lasting longer than the standard recovery process of an injury. Um, one of the excellent approaches that includes no medication is behavioral medicine approaches. Um, and my favorite is cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's meeting with a licensed trainer. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, teaches you techniques to um, control the way you think and how you perceive pain. Uh, and that directly benefits the, any pain down the road. Um, also, there's biofeedback therapies. Um, and these are pretty neat. Uh, you meet with a, a trainer and they hook you up to a machine that monitors your heart rate and your breathing rate um, and checks your, um, your skin for any sweat. And they put you through a series of tests that kind of stimulate your heart rate to go up, your respiratory rate to go up, make you a little sweaty. And just doing that and being able to see that on a monitor um, helps your brain recognize what those triggers are and how to control them. 
relaxation therapy, uh, similar to massage therapy, is excellent for, for chronic pain. And then uh, a psychotherapy and individual or group counseling. Um, so groups with chronic pain, um, just talking about what works for them with others and having support groups, very effective. Next for um, chronic pain, I want to talk about acupuncture. And this can also be used for acute pain as well, um, but there's a lot of good um, data to support its use in chronic pain uh, being very effective. And this is one of those therapies I, I mentioned earlier, you always start with the, the least potential toxic and then add in things that might have more risk to them. Acupuncture is very, very low risk with potential high benefit. So there's very few risks associated with it and um, folks that get relief get great relief from it. Has anyone had acupuncture? What are some of the um, bad effects of it? Decreased pain. Oh. Mm -hmm. And also increased joint mobility. Oh. I, I said the bad effects. Yeah. Oh, the bad effects. Yeah. Um, so there's very, um, very few bad effects. Oh. Uh, there would be things like um, uh, skin irritation from the needles, uh, very rare infection, things like that. Do you know of a local acupuncturist? I am familiar with um, with one, um, and her name uh, is slipping my mind right now, um, but I can get that for you. Thank you. And also, there's there's different styles of acupuncture. Um, there's some um, therapists that uh, work in just scalp acupuncture, some that do whole body, some that do joint acupuncture. Hmm. What about reflexology? Uh, is that connected with yes. acupuncture? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and that's part of the, uh, <coughs> the Chinese medicine and Eastern medicine approaches, uh, which are very helpful for a lot, of, a lot of patients. And again, it's very low risk therapy, but potential <coughs> benefits. Uh, th these are all therapies that don't have any systemic side effects, unlike medications. Um, so the next uh, big area is electrical <coughs> neuromodulation. Um, common uh, device there is called the TENS unit. Um, I don't know if anyone has experience with that, but it's a, um, a, a unit that's commonly used with physical therapists, but you can also buy um, for your home use as well now and you apply electrodes to different parts of the body where you might have muscle spasm or pain, um, and then you can control electrical impulses to that part of the body to help uh, control muscle spasm. That stuff works. <clears throat> We've got one. Mm -hmm. My wife is retired from Gwinnett Medical, and the guy that, or the doctor, I should say, that did one of her shoulder operations gave us one of the professional um, with all these little electrodes that you can stick on yourself. And boy, if you got soreness from working in the yard or playing ball or something, mm -hmm. that thing, I mean, it gets rid of it in an hour. Yep. It really helps with the muscle yes. soreness. And it's also used after surgeries mm -hmm. to help stimulate cramping as well. Yeah. And there's also um, electro, electrical neuromodulation with acupuncture as well. Um, so some acupuncturists will use the needles and then attach um, small electrodes and send an electrical current between two points of acupuncture. And then also there's um, implantable devices that some surgeons use that um, are spinal cord stimulators to prevent uh, surges of pain. All right, and then uh, moving on, interventional and surgical approaches. Um, so I list quite a few of them here. We'll kind of go one by one. Uh, ablative <laughs> techniques. That's a, a surgical procedure to uh, to kind of kill the nerve ending that might be causing pain. Uh, so Botox injections are next, or botulinum. Botox is used for a wide variety of things now. It used to be. Um, you know, cosmetically used, but now it's used for a lot of chronic pain and uh, specifically chronic migraine headaches. A lot of neurologists use um, a series of Botox injections to help uh, prevent headaches. Nerve blocks are common. These are typically done with, uh, with lidocaine injectables. Trigger point injections are very common. 
uh, can be done in uh, a wide variety of offices. I do them in my office. It's uh, typically done with a lidocaine and you identify a trigger point, which might be uh, a muscle that's in spasm or something very tender on the body. Um, so if you ever had a therapist or a physician kind of poke around on your back or in your leg trying to find that one spot that's real tender, that's where you would direct a trigger point injection. Uh, epidural steroid injections, um, that's an option for some people with uh, back issues. Next I put in here prolotherapy and neuroprolotherapy injections um, and regenerative injections. These are uh, very new therapies out there. And unfortunately, uh, they're not covered by insurance, but these help promote growth of new tissue um, instead of just treating what might be um, a symptom. They help grow new healthy tissue. Um, Prolotherapy is um, used to um, inject a, a solution of almost sugar water into an area of tenderness causing inflammation that inflammation in turn signals the body to restore the area and fix it. So for chronic injuries, um, it's used for plantar fasciitis, it's used for chronic knee arthritis, something that's been going on for a long time. The body may have uh, turned it down on its priority list of things to heal. So the neuro, um, sorry, the prolotherapy uh, redirects the body to help heal that area. Neuroprolotherapy is similar, uh, but it's directed at uh, peripheral nerves, especially people with um, regional pain syndromes um, or headaches or upper back aches. Uh, Neuroprolotherapy works very well. And then the regenerative injections, uh, you may be hearing more and more about it because it's, uh, the data comes in very well on it. This is taking your own stem cells and injecting them into areas where your body needs growth. So for, um, hear a lot about it in professional athletes who have tears and ligaments, um, who have knee issues, they'll take some of the patient's own stem cells, then redirect them and uh, inject them into the knee or the area of damage to promote new growth. So it's a real uh, fascinating field and it's, you know, it's very rapidly growing. Unfortunately, like I said, it's new and um, it's not covered by insurance, so it is quite expensive. So the topical therapies, uh, these are kind of broken down into three main classes. So in topical NSAIDs, that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, those are common medications. We'll talk in just a second about those. Um, but that's like uh, Believe or Motrin or Advil. Uh, they come in a topical formulation, which is better for a lot of patients because it's not systemically absorbed. So it's just uh, localizes on the area of pain. So topical therapies are, are good because they're not systemically <coughs> absorbed and they don't interact with other medications. Uh, so that might be an option as well. What the vitamin K? Mm -hmm. So that they don't interact, with, uh, they don't have vitamin K or they don't interact with any other, other medications you might be taking. Other topical things which are over-the-counter topical capsaicin cream Capsaicin is a, a derivative of uh, red peppers, um, so the, the spicy peppers. Um, so used topically, they kind of deactivate the pain fibers on the skin um, and cause a relief of pain. Um, the only caveat there is some people get a, a bad reaction to it because it's like a hot pepper and they can get a little redness on the skin. But other things are uh, commonly used, so topical menthol, that's kind of the icy hot patch things like that can help with um, a lot of folks. And then also there's topical lidocaine preparations, uh, which again, decrease the pain um, over the area without being systemically absorbed. So that's helpful. Now the next one kind of going into the, uh, going into the oral medications. So Tylenol, uh, it is the first line pain medication for older adults. Um, like you mentioned earlier, it doesn't interact with um, other medications, <clears throat> doesn't increase your risk for bleeding, things like that. Due to that, it is first line. Uh, the maximum dose is 
a little bit disputed, but it's between uh, three and 4,000 milligrams per day. And the uh, thing to look out for is if you have a cold and you're taking uh, Tylenol for pain, you want to make sure that cold medicine doesn't have any Tylenol in it as well. And a lot of times people end up taking more Tylenol than they can handle and not realizing it because so many over-the-counter uh, medications, especially for cold symptoms, have Tylenol already built into it. How many pills would you have to take to get 3,000 milligrams? Six. The extra strength comes anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milligrams per pill. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if someone mm -hmm. takes um, two tablets three times a day, they're already at, and then that's the 500 milligram they're already at. I didn't realize the pills were that high. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next main group is the NSAIDs. Uh, I mentioned the, the brand names earlier. It's the Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Um, there's also uh, a few others, Meloxicam or Mobic. It's a prescription NSAID, <coughs> Diclofenac, a prescription NSAID. <coughs> These aren't first-line medications in older adults, uh, but they are first-line in younger adults. The reason they're not first-line in older adults is because they um, have an increased side effect profile. Um, they can cause bleeding issues, um, they can cause uh, stomach issues and ulcers, they can cause kidney injury and kidney failure and some heart issues. Yes, ma'am? Uh, meloxicam, is it uh, over the camera or prescription? That's uh, prescription. Yeah, and that's the, uh, Mobic is the brand name. And it does cause stomach problems. It can. It can. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, right here. Uh, so this, I, what is this? Is this ibuprofen, is, is it considered as being Adivia, Motrin? Yes, what, that's the. I mean, it's just something separate. Is that's it, the active ingredient in Advil and Motrin. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So this, this is, this, uh, what is it? Uh, Ibuprofen. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can buy it generic as well, but the, these are the two main brand names. You say they have side effects? Oh. It does. A lot of people can't tolerate these medicines because of increased risks of bleeding or uh, stomach ulcers, kidney injury, things like that. Oh. And so that's why they're not used uh, first line in older adults with chronic conditions or who might be on medications for high blood pressure or blood thinners. And then finally, uh, some of the other prescription medications used for pain are common ones. So uh, antidepressants, uh, the main one that's used for pain is Cymbalta as a great medication for pain. Um, Anticonvulsants such as gabapentin um, used for folks with diabetes with pain, a very common medicine. Uh, muscle relaxers are used, um, although muscle relaxers can be dangerous because they make you very sleepy. And a lot of the studies show that <clears throat> the benefit of muscle relaxers isn't that they relax the muscle, it's just it makes you sleepy enough that you can get a good night's rest. Whatever <laughs> 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 works. It's called a back door approach. Yep. I've been taking that gamma for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't sleep yet. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, <clears throat> at the very end, there's opiate medications as well. And so a lot of people are concerned about uh, addiction with opiate medications. Mm -hmm. uh, Where are some of those? Some of the names of the that opiates. Um, so morphine, uh, Percocet, uh, Oxycontin. Oxycontin. Yeah. What about tramadol? Where would it fit? Tramadol is um, considered a um, kind of a cousin to the opiate family. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. for um, legal purposes, it's considered a controlled substance, just like opiates. Okay. But uh, it's not uh, quite in the same class. Doesn't have the same uh, profile. But it's still used to treat pain. More tramadol too, man. Mm -hmm. What's a muscle? What's a common muscle rash? Uh, mm -hmm. um, so Robaxin, or Flexeril. Did you say that, like a leave and Advil, those come in a cream form? They do. Really? Yes. Uh, Diclofenac is the NSAID that comes in the cream. It's uh, the brand name is called Volterin Gel. And it can be very effective uh, for anti-inflammatory properties and pain properties in folks who can't, <coughs> can't take the pill because of bleeding risks or because of um, ulcers in the stomach, because of kidney issues. Mm -hmm. 
that's a, that's a good option for folks um, who might be on uh, restriction from other medicines. And then back to opiates real quick, um, because some folks do need opiates, um, and there is a, a concern of addiction. <coughs> Anytime you take an opiate medication, you will develop a tolerance to it um, and a physical dependence to it, but that doesn't always equal addiction. So addiction rates are actually quite low. Um, unfortunately, we hear a lot about it in the news. We hear a lot of people abusing those medications. Um, but just know that tolerance and physical dependence does not equal addiction. That's the ones that people steal, is that right? When you, when you see somebody broken into a CVS or a Walgreens, mm -hmm. that's what they steal. Yes, sir. So would you, would you clarify the difference between physical dependence and addiction then? Sure. Uh, physical dependence to a medication, that means if you stopped abruptly, you would likely have withdrawal symptoms. Okay. Um, sweating, increased heart rate, uh, increased pain levels. So with, with any um, opiate medicine, if you take it for a prolonged period of time, uh, say three weeks or longer, and you abruptly stop without tapering it down, you will have those symptoms. But that doesn't mean your brain is chemically addicted to the drug. Wow. And so that, does, that doesn't mean that uh, you'll be craving the drug and you'll uh, resort to other options to try to get that drug. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Oh, I said I was going to wrap up with the injectables. So um, injectable steroids are uh, an excellent tool to deal with pain, especially arthritis pain. Um, so injections for bursitis are very common to calm down the inflammation. Um, injections in the knee are very common, shoulder injections. Um, those are all done mostly in primary care offices and by orthopedics. So you do that, that kind of thing in your office? I do. Yes, sir. Do, you, uh, do you do the massage therapy as well? I do not do massage therapy directly, but I do um, soft tissue osteopathic manipulative therapy. Okay. Is that, is that similar? It's similar, but it, um, it's more directed. Uh -huh. uh, and then massage therapy plans um, typically are multiple times a week right. for a set amount of time. Right. Uh, my personal approach with osteopathic manipulative therapy is to um, get things stabilized and then teach the patient how to do certain things at home so that you don't have to come see me every month. So do you take blue cloth or blue shield? I do, yes. How about well, okay, I have a problem with them. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Once somebody wants to have that kind of surgery, like what, you know, put the needle in the back, do it, do it like last a lifetime, or you have to come back ever so often and get it done over and over and over? So, unfortunately, everyone has different outcomes from that. Uh, <laughs> that needle's going to get you in there. <laughs> Some folks um, can get six months to a year of relief. Um, other folks just have a few days. Do they? Mm -hmm. They come back to you? It can. But what they try to average is about three months of relief per injection. And so every, everyone's different, everyone responds to it differently. Sure. All right, have a great afternoon. Excuse me. I got a question. Are there. Are the issues for senior citizens? Okay, all right. Well, I can do what you're talking about. Thank you. 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 You guys need to take care of anything that you're going to have to have done surgically because Medicare is changing and they're going to start cutting people off at a certain age. I've heard that. Cutting off. Off, but not paying for it. Right. In other words, you older? Yeah. Wow. In other words, instead of doing knee surgery, they'll hand you a walker and say, you know, once you. Mm -hmm. and because, you know, they're not going to do knee surgery on, you know, 92 year old great grandma oh, okay. because her life expectancy is whatever it is but um did you see any of that with some of these therapies that insurance pays for some doesn't pay for others absolutely 
And uh, a lot of um, water insurance companies will require you to uh, try uh, a lot of the other techniques before they'll um, allow for a, a surgery or a more invasive procedure. Yeah. And uh, some of it's seen, uh, some insurance companies, even if the patient needs an MRI, they'll say, well, they have to have completed this amount of therapy and have tried this and have tried that. And if all, unless those are completed, we're not going to approve an MRI or approve a, a procedure. Yeah. So. I, the so, days of walking in and getting whatever the doctor says is what you do is gone, I guess. Yes, sir. And unfortunately, it's uh, dictated mm -hmm. pretty heavily by insurance companies. Well, that could be counterproductive, couldn't it? <laughs> it's extremely counterproductive. Well said. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> They're frustrating on both ends. I think the insurance company hopes you'll die and they won't have to pay any more money. That's <laughs> terrible to say, but, you know. Well, people living longer. Yeah. Social but, Security didn't count on that. They are doing, uh, at least my, my I, we're with Cigna HealthSpring, and they are doing a lot of wellness things. They are. I mean, we get uh, something like almost every other month about something to go do, and mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah. Things yeah. that are very... Uh, proactive and try to keep you well because it, it, it really is less expensive for them. Sure. Yeah. But uh, that's a good and trend. It, it's good to see that they're realizing that it's better yeah. to keep people healthy than it is to yeah. uh, pay for complications down the road. That's the way our insurance company is. Only they want a nurse to come out to your house and give you a check, check up mom. And when the last time they called me, I said, I just went to my doctor and you know, she said I was fine, you know, that I had no major problems, and so, I mean, you know, you wonder if sometimes they couldn't save money by not doing things coming out. Maybe it's something I don't see. Yeah, understand. coordinated. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, insurance companies are out there to make money. So you wonder if there's best interest to have at heart. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.